to take our offering this evening, we'll take a songbook. Let's turn to 108. We'll do the first and fourth, Rescue the Perishing. 108, you can remain seated. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save on the last. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer the Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. So we look at the prayer cards that have been turned in this evening. Uh, this is from Sarah Hall. Uh, pray for John Booth. Um, he has a blood clot in his legs and some other health problems. And that's uh, Miss Sarah's brother. So that's John Booth. Tony Garner Wilson. Uh, she has ovarian cancer, had surgery and chemo to follow soon. And this is from Pat McNeil. So remember Tony Wilson uh, with surgery and now chemo to follow. Uh, Paul Quillen, this is uh, from Ramey, and uh, he's asking that we pray for healing, both physical and spiritual. And again, that name is Paul Quillen. And then Johnny Milliken, uh, dealing with gout in his feet, and um, just be in prayer for Johnny Milliken. And this is um, from Anna Joyce, I believe. So. Oh, okay, her sister's husband. So uh, remember Johnny Milliken as well this evening. Um, if I could, I'd like to get, um, I'm going to ask uh, my father-in-law, Larry, if you'll kind of open us up in prayer here in just a moment. And then Brother Eric, if you'll kind of close us out. Uh, as we kind of take a look at our prayer list for this week, certainly remember the college students. I know I mentioned Hannah. But we have Haven Davis at Randolph Community College, Michael Million, Brunswick Community College, uh, Caleb Penland heading down to Pensacola. I think you're heading out Friday, is that right? So be in prayer for him. And then Eric Thomas at uh, RCC here in town. And uh, as usual, there's certainly a lot of health needs. Uh, others have been mentioned tonight. And uh, certainly continue to remember what the pastor said last week about the salvation list. I know several of you raised your hand as far as praying specifically for a person on the salvation list. So uh, we'll continue that the upcoming week as well. Uh, do be in prayer. Um, you know, I, I look at that list and there's 27 names there. And that is just, I don't know how to put that in the context of if you were to just look within a one mile radius of here that uh, it would be a very minute drop in the bucket but uh do be in prayer for the names there on the salvation list and uh like i said uh, i know some of you volunteered specifically for certain uh for certain people so continue that uh continue to remember our military and several of those there that are connected with our church family here and uh, be in prayer for our leaders, both nationally and the state level. Uh, I, I, try to, I try to stay on top of what's going on, but sometimes uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, because it seems like you can turn on the news or go to a news website and you just kind of sit there and shake your head and think, these are actually adults making decisions and they make no sense. But I'll keep the rest of my comments to myself. Pat.
Oh, amen. Oh, I bet so. I always get tickled at Charlie because a lot of times he'll come up here and he'll shake my hand and it's, he, he'll give me this look like he really wants to tell me something and he'll go, hey. And there's been a couple of times we've had some interesting conversations, but uh, I think Charlie certainly has a, a big heart and uh, we, we appreciate um, just kind of looking at what the Lord's done in his life. So uh, certainly want to want to thank the Lord for, for those folks stepping in and and working on the parsonage down there. Uh, at this time, if there's nothing else that we need to mention, I'm going to ask Larry to open us up, and then Eric, if you'll, you'll close us out once he finishes.
Brother Chris, at this time, we'll have you come on and, and turn the service over to you. We certainly appreciate um, your outreach here from the church to the, the jails and prisons and the work Miss Anna does. We'll have you close out as you see fit. Is this thing on? All right. Good deal. Well, first of all, turn to James chapter number four. While you're turning there, uh, it's been a while since we've been here. Had I tell you what, it feels good to be back home, though. Uh, we've been traveling to several different churches, and uh, last week we were uh, down at uh, Pastor Chris Chautauqua's church uh, at Holden Beach. I guess if you're going to have a special meeting, Holden Beach is a good place to do it. But um, he sends his love to everybody, him and his wife. And they're, they're missing their uh, oldest daughter. They sent her off to college. And uh, doing very well, though. The church is doing real well. Um, last night, I actually had another message I had uh, planned for today. And last night, I actually dreamed this message. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, let's first go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you and praise you for this time you've given us today, Lord, to come here and worship you, Lord. Now let us lay aside all these different things that interrupt our mind. Let us completely concentrate on you and your word. Let us forget the troubles of this world and concentrate on you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. In James chapter 4, starting in um, verse 14, it says, Whereas ye know not, what shall be on the morrow? For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You know, Johnny was talking about watching news and how news can be so depressing sometimes. I can't think of a time here lately that every time you turn on the news, somebody's getting killed. And our life truly is but a vapor. And you know, even if you live to a hundred years old, that's really nothing compared to eternity. You know, um, I tell the guys all the time at the jail, I say, you know, I don't care why you're in here, but this sentence is going to end one day. Even if it ends with them sticking the needle in your arm, it is going to end one day. But the next judge, when he puts his gavel down, that one ain't going to end. You probably wonder why I lit this candle. I hope y'all can see it. But when you blow that out, I realize that's not a water vapor. But see, by the time it gets right here, you don't see the smoke no more. It's already gone. It's just a vapor. That's literally what that verse was talking about. Your life is just and gone. So even though our life is just a small vapor, how can we make our life count? How can we make a difference here on earth? Because, you know, everybody, I can't think of anybody that would say, you know what, I want to go to my grave and not accomplish nothing in life. I can't think of anybody that would be that way. So how do we make a difference? The first step into making a difference is, see, you got to understand that this is not the real deal. This is not real life. The real life is the eternal life. And the way you get to heaven is by getting saved. See, a lot of people have this misconjunction that, you know, by doing good deeds, you get to heaven. By getting to heaven and, and, and God brings out this big scale and He weighs you good and you're bad. And if you're good, outweighs you bad, you're on your way in. I would be scared to death if that was the case for me. I'm afraid my bad might outweigh my good. And I'm glad it's not on my merit. I'm, I'm so thankful it's not on that. You see, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Born again means you become a new person. You have a second birth. You're born into Christ's family. The Bible says we're literally adopted sons and daughters unto Him. My, my younger brother adopted his daughter. Wow, it's probably been 15 years ago now. <laughs> I didn't realize how long ago it had been. But, yeah, but he adopted his youngest daughter, and when the, do, ado, the adoption papers were finalized, 
and everything was done, he called me up. And he said, when I was standing before the judge, the judge, and they had already had three children of their own by that time. He said, when I was standing before the judge, the judge told me that I could remove my last name from my birth children. That I could disown them out of my will. But that adopted one, legally, I could never remove her from my inheritance. She would always have a place in my inheritance. Are y'all getting that? Why ain't you hooting that, Holland? And see, <laughs> when you're saved, you're always going to be in his inheritance. Nothing can remove that. So how do you get saved? How do you start that journey? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to admit you got a problem. Each and every one of us, we've got a problem. We're all sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's you, that's me, that's Pastor Troy. Every one of us are sinners. You're born that way. There's nothing that can be done about it. As sweet and precious as these little children that, that, that we teach in Sunday school. If you ask them if they've done something wrong, they'll lie to you in a minute. Won't they? Your grand youngs has lied to me, Eric. <laughs> they will. They'll lie. Lord, you probably told them that, didn't you? No, you don't have to teach a young and to lie. They know that already. You have to teach them to be good. Because, see, they're born sinners. They know that. And see, there's a payment that has to be made for your sin. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, a wage is, is actually like a salary. Uh, it would be much like, let's say I was going to hire you to come and uh, work on my deck. And let's say I was going to pay you $10 an hour to do it. And it took you four 10-hour days to fix my deck up. At the end of those four 10-hour days, what are you going to expect? $400, right? Because you've earned it. That is your wage. You deserve it. The Bible says here, what you earn, what you deserve, what you have rightly coming to you for your sin is death. And that word death that's used there in Romans actually means spiritual separation from God. So the only place you can be spiritually separated from God is hell. So let's put it right down where the rubber meets the road. What you deserve for your sinful lifestyle, for being born into sin already, is going to hell. That sounds strong, don't it? And it is. And it's real. And there's people that are going to hell every day because of complacent Christians that don't care. That's right. But now listen to this. But God, God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Because you know, while I was out there acting a the fool, while I was out there doing all the mess I shouldn't have done, Christ still died for me. He cared for me. He loved me. He saw me when He was hanging on that cross. And you know what? Our wage is death. Christ did what? Died. He paid it. He paid the wage for us. And if you can honestly admit that and agree with that, and then this is the important part, accept that, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I had a guy to jail one time after he said, so you mean if I just say, Lord, come to my heart, I'm saved? I said, no, it takes a little more than that. I said, that word call actually means to turn toward and call. That's that act of repentance and turning away from sinful lifestyle and turning toward Christ. Without that, you're not saved. If anybody tells you you are, they're a liar. Every account of a person getting saved in the New Testament has repentance. There's nobody that got saved in the New Testament without changing. You can't pray a prayer and keep living the same old way. It don't work that way. Now, once you do get saved, how do you make your life count here on this earth? 
because you see, what it really needs to be counting for is what's after this. That's what you're working toward. Obey God's commandments. And there's a bunch of commandments in the Bible. A bunch of them. But I'll just give you a few of them. First of all, you need to find a good Bible-preaching, truth-teaching church. This is one of them. All of them ain't, but this is one. And get involved. You don't get the truth by not getting involved. It tears me up sometimes to see somebody that only comes to church about once every three months and say, well, I'm really not getting nothing out of church because you ain't there. Get involved. Volunteer for stuff. Get, get, get busy about doing God's work in the church. You know, if God did not want the church, He would not have ordained and started it. I hear people all the time, well, I can worship at home. That ain't what the Bible says. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Come together. There's strength in numbers. I, I really, I, could, I wouldn't know how to act without coming to church on Sundays. I, I really, and when, I, when, when my leg was in the cast and it was hurting so bad, you can ask my wife. I was literally sitting there on the couch watching church service here in tears because I wasn't here. Be in church. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe if you're truly saved, your heart will want to be in church. It will want to be in church. It won't nobody have to drag you there kicking and screaming. I think you'll want to be there. You know, you need to follow uh, Christ's command and be baptized. That's right. And baptized means to be put under water. don't mean to have somebody sling some water on your head. It means to be dunked. The word baptismos means to be dunked like a donut or immersed. Now, if you was going to do a sprinkling, you'd have to use that Greek word called rainius, where we get our word rain from. It's a whole different word. Because it's a whole different meaning. And you think about it, if somebody dies today, we don't sprinkle dirt on their head and figure they're buried, do we? Well, we don't. And see, baptism is death to that old man and resurrection to the new man. You bury that old man and you rise to the new man. That's what it pictures. How are you going to picture that with sprinkling some water on somebody? No, that don't work. You need to be baptized. You say, well, preacher, I'm scared of water. I think you'll make it. Because you really, if you want to be in God's perfect plan of, of obeying Him, that's one of the ordinances that he laid out. And you need to do that. You need to pray. The Bible teaches us to pray without ceasing. The Bible teaches us to pray for one another. That's the reason it's important to be in a church because you got that prayer structure praying for each other. If you didn't go to church, how would anybody know what you need prayer for? They wouldn't know. But you need to pray. Have regular communication with God. Talk to God. When you're riding down the road, just talk to Him. And by the way, God understands Redneck because He understands me. You can just talk to Him. You ain't got to use all them fancy words, this, that. Just talk to God. And I know people think I'm crazy sometimes when I'm riding because it looks like I'm talking to myself. I'm sitting there in the car just praying away. Talk to Him. He loves it. He loves it. And by the way, when you're doing that riding down the highway, it's real hard to fuss at somebody for cutting you off. <laughs> it is. Read and study God's Word. You know, there is a difference between reading and studying. And actually, I try to set that, those times up different for me. My study time is different than my read time. In the morning, I just read because my mind's not quite all awake yet. So I just read five or ten chapters in the morning. But then, later on in the day, I sit down and I may just take one word and study it for a while and ponder on it, muse them things, think about them. And it's amazing the little nuggets God will give you when you do that. And you pray for those nuggets. And He'll bless you with them. 
But you know what? You won't get none of that if you don't ever read it. I remember when I was a youth pastor over at uh, Faith Temple, I walked in one time, and one of the youth had left their Bible in the church pew. I took a piece of paper and I wrote, had many things to tell you this week, but sorry, you never took me home to read. He just left it on the Bible. <laughs> but you know, we do have a very busy life and our, our world has gotten very busy around us. But please make time for God. My goodness, He made time for you. Read your word. Study your word. If you're truly saved, I can't imagine you not wanting to tell someone else about the salvation that you've experienced. So win. You know, the Bible says one who so wins is wise. When souls is wise. And, you know, I can't imagine getting a gift so great of a, a salvation and not want to tell somebody about it. I really, I really can't. I, I don't understand that. Uh, you, have, you can ask anybody who knows me very well. If, if I go into Walmart and there's somebody that will stop for a second, I'm talking to them about the Lord. And, and, and it's just, that's the only thing that's on my mind a lot of times. How can I get to that conversation? Because just like Johnny said just a minute ago, there's literally thousands of people here right around us that are going to go to hell. And God commanded that we be soul winners. And He didn't say preachers. He didn't say deacons. He didn't say trustees. He says, go. That means all of us. <clears throat> and I know somebody might be saying, well, you know, I'm just not real good at talking to folks. Give them a track. Do something. To be a soul winner. And people do get saved by tracks. They do. You know, also have a giving spirit. The Bible says it's better to give than receive. You know, uh, there's been so many times in the ministry that I, I, that I can't count the times that God has provided for us when I couldn't see any way that it was going to happen. And it came from people with giving hearts. They just obeyed God. And um, does God need your money? No, not a bit. He owns it all anyhow. He don't need your money, but what He would love to have is your heart and your obedience. And usually a person's heart's closely connected to the billfold. So He don't have to have it. But when you show that that's not more important than God, you're showing who you really love. That's the deal. You're showing where your love really is. And there's more giving than just money, guys. You know, somebody moves into the neighborhood that's new. How many, how many of you, us even have remotely thought about baking a, can of, a thing of cookies and taking it over to them and welcoming them to the area? You, know, you don't hear about stuff like that happening anymore. You ain't got nobody. You, you bring me some cookies. I'm okay with that. <laughs> and you know, you, you can give him your time. Like, you know, little Charlie and Denise clean, cleaning the parsonage. You know, that, that's amazing. Just give him your time if you don't have the money to give. Give, give something to God. Because he gave so much for us. You know, in Matthew 6, 19, it says, Lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth, for moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay, upon, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break in nor steal. You know, how do we do this? How do we lay up treasures in heaven? It's by the things we do here on earth. It's by the testimony that we live. It's by the, the, the literally the walk that we walk. It needs to match the talk that we talk. You know, a lot of folks may not ever speak to you, but I promise you, if they know that you're a Christian, they're watching you. They're watching every move. Is he going to compromise on this issue? Is he going to compromise here? Is he going to compromise here? How's he going to respond to this? How's he going to respond to that? And they watch. They watch. I had a guy at work one time. Came up to me. I hadn't seen him about three or four years because he was working over in Winston when we had a uh, hangar over there. And he moved back to Greensboro. And he didn't look like nothing like the guy that went to Winston. The guy that went to Winston had hair down to here and earrings hanging all out and everything. And me and him was as polar opposite as North and South Pole. 
And um, he come back and he had short hair, shirt tail tucked in. Looked complete. In fact, I didn't even recognize him in the beginning. And when we were walking out through the ramp there in between the hangers, he goes, hey, Chris, come here a minute. And I went over to him. He goes, he said, I want to thank you. Because of you, I'm saved and I go to church today. I'm like, well, John, I don't remember talking to you about the Lord. He said, you did every day. He said, they gave you the nastiest, dirtiest, stankingest job on the airplane they could give you every day. And you went in there singing to your Lord every day, doing it. He said, I had to have that God. He says, my whole family's in church today, and we're doing great. He said, I just want to thank you for that. Sometimes it's just your life, guys. Sometimes it's just your life. What kind of seed are you sowing? What kind of seed are you placing out around your path as you walk every day? What kind of plants are you planting? You know, a man can very easily count how many seeds are in an apple, can't you? But no man can count how many apples are in a seed. See, our church started with 12 men in Jerusalem. Look what it's become. I wonder if those 12 men were picked out of this church if it would have done the same thing. If it would have grown just as much. Something to think about, isn't it? You know, our life is truly just a vapor and you're not guaranteed your next breath. And that's not a doom and gloom story. It's true. You're not. You may not be here Sunday for worship. But every breath you do have, understand that you have done nothing to make your heart beat and you've done nothing to make your lungs work. God has given you that. You've done nothing for that. What are you going to do with it? If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, tonight would be a good night to do that. Get that settled. If you do know, what are you going to do with your vapor? Because it don't last very long. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to lay up your treasures in heaven? Wouldn't it be a shame to go to heaven and you see all these folks getting crowns and the Lord says, well, I'm sorry, you didn't earn one. Wow, that'd be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we're here tonight thinking about how short and literally fleeting life is, and the older I get, it seems like the faster it goes. I remember when I was young, it seemed like summertime lasts forever. And now, three years go by in the summertime. But, you know, we want to do something. We want to make just a small mark, if any at all. Have some lost soul get saved. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus is your Savior, you'd say, preacher, I, I was the one you were talking to when you said, you know, you really need to get saved. If you were to die today, if, if today was your last breath, do you know, without a doubt, 100% for sure that you're on your way to heaven? If you do know for sure, well, just raise your hand and praise God for that. If you know for sure you're on your way to heaven, you have no doubt whatsoever, there were some people that wasn't able to raise their hand this, just then. If you were not able to raise your hand, you say, Preacher, I just don't know for sure, and I want you to pray for me. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out, but I would like to pray for you. Is there anyone like that at all? Anyone at all say, you know what, Preacher? Pray for me. I'm just not sure I'm saved tonight. Amen. Anyone else? Heavenly Father, you've seen these hands, and you know these hearts. And I pray that you would touch each and every person here tonight. I pray that you would be with us, Lord, to help us to truly make a difference not here on this earth, but laying up our treasures in heaven. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you've done in our lives and for all you're going to do. In your precious name I pray. Amen. All right, y'all dismissed.